Então, boa tarde a todos. É, esse é mais um webinar solidário é, da Sobrice. É, Bem-vindos da Sociedade Brasileira de Radiologia Intervencionista e da cirurgia endovascular, de cirurgia endovascular. Esse webinar a gente já tem é, visto em outras cidades, ele tem o objetivo principal de arrecadar doações, que estão revertidas em, em cestas básicas e são distribuídas em, em comunidades carentes pelo Brasil, em algumas cidades pré-definidas. E no Rio, com esse webinar, a gente conseguiu contribuir com cinco toneladas de cesta básica em alimentos que foram entregues é, semana passada. Então, é, antes de tudo, eu queria agradecer as empresas que, que colaboraram com essa ação, é, a Ecomed, a Tecnicare, a Cortex Med e a Amed, e a todos que, que contribuíram e doaram é, para a Sobrice e para essa nossa ação no Rio de Janeiro. E eu aproveito já para divulgar o próximo webinar, que vai ser em Recife, no dia, vai ser a ação de Recife no dia 28 de julho, às 19 horas, e o tema vai ser proteção radiológica, é um bate-papo para profissionais que realizam procedimentos guiados por fluoroscopia. Então, vai ser um tema interessante que está muito em alta também. É, então, vamos começar o nosso webinar. O webinar vai ser dividido em duas aulas. É, a primeira aula, duas aulas de 20 minutos. E no final, nós deixamos, ela vai ter um total de uma hora, no final deixamos 20 minutos para perguntas e respostas. Então, se durante as apresentações já surgirem algumas perguntas, é, vocês já podem começar a... A, a colocar na parte de é, QIA, de perguntas e respostas, e a gente vai responder no final da no final da, de toda a apresenta, das apresentações das apresentações. So today we have the honor to have two reference in the treatment of bone tumors. The first speaker will be Dr. Roberto Cazzato. He's associate professor of radiology at the University Hospital of Strasbourg, France. Roberto is the author of many important papers in this field, and he's a, a good friend, and it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. And the second speaker will be Dr. Alexis Kalexis. Uh, Dr. Alexis is Associate Professor of Interventional Radiology at Athens, Greece. And me and Dr. Marcelo Bordalo will be the moderators. Uh, Marcelo is, the, is an interventional radiologist, as you know, at Hospital Sirio Libanês and Hospital das Clinicas in Sao Paulo. So let's start in time. So we start with the first pre presentation of Dr. Katsato. He will talk about bone ablation and pain palliation and local tumor control. Thanks, Roberto, for your availability in this difficult time. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation. It was really a pleasure for me uh, to, to answer to your invitation because uh, the scope was the, the aim uh, was really noble and then uh, uh, both of you are clear two great friends of mine so it was really easy and I did it with pleasure so thank you once again I'm sorry so, Alexis, Alexis welcome sorry Gigi uh, Alexis is is now uh, we had just introduced to, introduced to the the webinar Alexis welcome thanks for being here I think I think he is listening. Okay, let's start, Gigi. Okay. So, um, I will speak about uh, uh, bone ablation, bone tumor ablation, in order to achieve uh, pain management uh, and local tumor control. So, when we have a look at the you have to share a screen. Uh, you have to have share a screen. It's not sharing. Is not share? No. Oh, no. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh. So when we uh, speak about uh, uh, percutaneous techniques, basically we have uh, uh, two possibilities. Uh, either we, um, we provide consoli bone consolidation and we will see with the next presentation. And this kind of uh, context, we can uh, uh, provide no kind of local tumor control, so the treatment is completely palliative and aims to achieve a pain management through a fracture fixation. And the other possibilities is to provide um, percutaneous ablation with hot or cold techniques in order to provide pain management or local tumor control. If uh, we have a look at the um, 
population of patients coming with these kind of tumors needing our percutaneous treatment, unfortunately, and uh, still now, the vast majority of patients comes for a palliative treatment, meaning that they need either pain management, either fracture management. So we, with palliative treatment, we aim at fixing one or more skeletal related events. So palliative management may be provided either with bone consolidation, either with bone ablation. On the other side, when we move to the curative setting, which is uh, provided to patients with the small painful uh, benign tumors or with patients uh, with oligometastatic or oligoprogression disease. This represents really a minority of the patients that we see in our daily life. And in order to achieve a complete local tumor control, meaning a complete tumor destruction, we cannot avoid the use of ablation, which may be then be followed by bone consolidation, but we cannot provide um, a local tumor control without ablation. These were the uh, first the two main papers that proved that basically cryoablation and radiofrequency ablation, which are still the two most commonly used techniques, were effective in achieving uh, pain management in uh, uh, a population affected by bone metastasis. And basically, the main findings of this paper were that um, pain was really controlled. This control was uh, long lasting up to six months and the intake of painkillers was really reduced. So these two are the two milestones in uh, pain management of bone metastasis uh, achieved with the percutaneous ablation, which definitely proved that this, these treatments are effective. And since then, the amount of procedures that, that, are, that were proposed and performed continues to grow. So if we need to make a differentiation between uh, radiofrequency ablation and cryoablation, in order to understand when one technique should be used uh, instead of the others, basically we can say that radiofrequency ablation is uh, particularly adapted for the treatment of small non-blastic tumors, including, for example, the small uh, um, lytic osteoblastoma, osteoblastoma with elitic aspects, or uh, a great achievements may be uh, obtained with bipolar radiofrequency ablation in spinal, spinal tumors. So radiofrequency ablation, we, should, we need to keep in mind that is adapted when we have small tumors without any kind of blastic aspect. On the other hand, when we have large sclerotic tumors, when we have a large involvement of soft tissues, when we have uh, lesions that are close to, me to metallic devices of, of, uh, or if we have patients with electric uh, metallic devices, like for example, cardiac pacemakers, in this kind of patients, cryoablation performs much better and should be preferred over cryoablation. Moreover, we need to to, we will see that another advantage of cryoablation is represented by the fact that the highs that we provide is intrinsically analgesic. And so the postoperative phase for patients is much more comfortable, much more easy compared to hot technique, including radiofrequency ablation. New techniques that are coming on, uh, on stage are uh, for sure microwave, microwave ablation. The problem with microwave ablation is that at the moment, the amount of experience that we have and the number of papers that have been published with these techniques are unfortunately not too much, not too many. So for the moment, we know that for sure it provides an effective pain relief when it is used to treat painful uh, bone metastasis as we can see from this paper that has been recently published in AJR, with the rates of local tumor control that are not so bad, but unfortunately there, in literature, there is a, a large heterogeneity uh, about the ablation protocols uh, that should be applied according to the type of tumor that we want to uh, treat. So probably this uh, technology will have a bright future, but at the moment the experience with it is uh, still some, somehow limit, limited. Another technology that will play, according to me and probably uh, 
many of you will agree on this point, will play a major role in the near future, will be probably IFU because uh, MRI guided IFU um, is uh, currently effective and used for the treatment of painful non-spinal bone mats. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the treatment is really um, valuable because it's non-invasive, it's provided without any kind of uh, percutaneous uh, approach. But at the moment, uh, we have no many data, no much data about uh, uh, the effectiveness of this uh, uh, therapy in terms of local tumor control. It is currently not provided for vertebral tumors because uh, um, the technique is uh, still deemed too uh, dangerous in this uh, setting. And we don't know what are uh, the, the, the combination and the results that we may achieve with this technique when it is combined with other treatments uh, like, for example, radiation therapy. Coming to uh, the clinical scenarios where uh, we treat our patients, the most common situation is to provide uh, percutaneous ablation in order to achieve uh, um, pain relief due to an inflammatory pain. In fact, when we have our patients that comes with a bone metastasis, we may face two clinical scenarios. The first one is represented by patients coming with a mechanic pain, which means that there is an underlying fracture that needs to be fixed. On the other end, we may have patients that come with an inflammatory pain. The inflammatory pain is completely, uh, is persistently present. Mechanic pain, on the other end, is more related with movement. So when we have an inflammatory pain, we need to destroy the tumor completely. Like, for example, in this case where I had this patient a uh, uh, few weeks ago with this uh, huge metastasis from lung cancer, the pain was constant. And so we provided the uh, cryoablation in order to achieve uh, uh, pain uh, relief. So when you have inflammatory pain and you are treating your patient in order to achieve uh, a local tumor, a, a pain relief, you are not obliged to uh, destroy completely the tumor. The minimal, the minimal uh, uh, goal that you should have in order to be effective in the pain relief is to destroy the interface between the tumor and the normal, tumor and the normal bone. But whenever you can, uh, it is always better, of course, to try to destroy as much as you can immediately even if the, the treatment is provided with a palliative intent, if you can achieve a local tumor control, it's always, um, it's always valuable and should be uh, tried all the time. Uh, we know from literature that uh, all kinds of treatments, uh, percutaneous or non-percutaneous, are really effective in achieving local tumor control. So the, choice of the technique, as I was telling before, should be done accordingly to the main uh, condition of the patients and especially of the main condition of the local uh, tumor. We know that uh, when we provide uh, our treatment in combination with radiation therapy, uh, which we need to remember is still uh, uh, the first uh, uh, gold standard uh, mainline treatment that is provided for a painful bone metastasis, we have a much better pain relief. Um, it is less likely that patients will re-experience a recurring pain and the morbidity is completely unaffected by this combined treatment. So whenever we can, if we work in collaboration with a radiation therapist, we can achieve much better results in terms of pain relief without increasing the morbidity, as, uh, um, without increasing morbidity. And so this is something that we should keep in mind and we should discuss with our patients and with our colleagues in the tumor board. Moreover, if we provide radiation therapy, radiofrequency ablation, and bone consolidation on the same target, as you can see from this systematic review, which was focused on vertebral uh, disease, but it may be extended also outside of the, the spine. So providing uh, all the treatment available, so radiation therapy and uh, ablation, in this case, radiofrequency ablation, to control the inflammatory pain, and uh, uh, bone consolidation, in this case vertebroplasty, to achieve, uh, uh, to control the mechanic pain, 
this is the best way that we can provide to our patients in order to have uh, the, very, the most effective uh, pain management. In terms of local tumor control, these are the results of our experience. Basically, as you can see, when we you treat uh, oligometastatic or uh, oligoprogressive disease in patients with uh, very small uh, uh, tumors, uh, sites less than two centimeters. The rate of, lo of local progression free survival at one and two here is quite high, and it's not much different from rates that are provided by the stereotactic bone radiation therapy. So, this means that uh, we can be effective also in providing local tumor control, provided that we, we, we are able to select the best candidates. So when we, the best candidates is the, that one who show us an oligometastatic or an oligoprogressive disease with the target tumor measuring no more than two centimeters. And if we have a look at the experience coming from the uh, team from Paris, so the team from uh, uh, by Professor Debert, they confirmed the rule of the two centimeters. So this means that um, they, they, we are more likely to provide an effective local tumor control when we treat small tumors less than two centimeters. But they identified also other uh, factors uh, being predictive of an effective local tumor control, including the absence of a cortical bone erosion, which means that the disease is still confined inside the bone, in the oligometastatic status, less than three meds, the metachnos disease, and the absence of uh, uh, proximity to nerve roots, which, are, um, which allows a large ablation, so which allows large safety margin, and so they, which allows the possibility to push uh, uh, the ablation forward without to achieve a local tumor control. So here we have a case of this uh, lady who presented with this single met from thyroid cancer, so a slow evolving disease. The lesion was really small, was confined uh, to the vertebral body, uh, did not disrupt the, um, the, 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 bone, the, the cortical bone. So we treated it with bi bilateral bipolar radio frequency ablation and uh, as you can see at the uh, PET CT performed that one year uh, follow up, we have no uptake of the radio tracer. So, to show you that this is uh, um, the, that when we have the good predictive factors uh, like uh, the small disease without cortical erosion, uh, far away from nerve roots, we can achieve a good local tumor control as. Uh, uh, the radiation therapies do, do, do with uh, uh, stereotactic bone radiation therapy. The only uh, case where we fail is when we have uh, a, an epidural, a metastatic epidural involvement. In this case, like for radiation therapists, we are dead. So it doesn't matter whatever you provide. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, it was one of the first case of my career, but it is always usual, uh, useful to show it because it, I think it's really, really educative, really uh, meaningful. So this patient had a, say, um, an HCC uh, with an epidural involvement. So the tumor was hypervascular, so we provided the embolization, which was limited to one side because on the other side we have the Adankiewicz the Adankiewi artery. Then we provided uh, many different impacts of uh, bilateral bipolar radio frequency ablation. We consolidated just thereafter, and then we treated the patient with radiation therapy. And despite of these efforts, a uh, few months later, the um, epidural disease continued to grow. So this, these are cases that whatever you do, they are probably uh, bad cases, and they are really likely to progress. We have really recently summarized our experience with uh, uh, spinal, bipolar, uh, spinal bipolar radio frequency ablation. And as you can see from, uh, from this uh, uh, data, these are, this is the thesis of uh, one of my residents. Uh, you can see that uh, bipolar radio frequency ablation is effective in uh, pain relief. It's effective in local tumor control, but when we treat um, in order to prevent complication, which is uh, in most of the cases, uh, the, um, the, 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 we, we try to, 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 pre to prevent the invasion of the tumor of the spinal canal. In this case, we are much less effective. So this is just to, to show you that unfortunately, when the disease 
approach the, um, the, the posterior vertebral body, we are really less likely to be successful. So for example, in this case, despite we have uh, still uh, a margin uh, of, the of, of normal bone, so the tumor didn't uh, invade yet the, um, the, 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 the spinal canal, we provided the, the ablation, but a few months later, here we see the tumor that progressing into the spinal canal. So unfortunately, this is uh, the, uh, the case. These are the cases that are less likely to respond. So in order to provide an effective local tumor control, we need to have small tumors far away from nerve roots and without cortical, uh, cortical erosion. Uh, I have recently come across this paper, which, which is quite interesting because it shows also that even for uh, local tumor control, providing a combined treatment of ablation and radiation therapy is much more effective than the uh, radiation, than the radiofrequency ablation treatment alone. So this means that we need also for local tumor control, be able to provide combined, combined uh, treatment, which are likely to be more effective in achieving local tumor control. Coming to complications about uh, uh, percutaneous ablation, we have recently summarized our experience uh, uh, with these two uh, papers uh, recently published on radiology. And uh, when we have a look at the, these two papers, basically both the radiofrequency ablation and cryoablation have uh, a similar rate of major complications. Coming to minor complications, radiofrequency ablation performs a little bit worse due to the fact that there is a, um, a large majority of patients that following radiofrequency ablation experience uh, a, a huge postoperative pain, which may impact the hospitalization, the length of the, of the in-hospital stay, and the length uh, and, the, and, the, and the discomfort of, of the patients, thus requiring dedicated uh, uh, analgesic uh, uh, protocols. Coming to the risk factors that predict all complications following a palliative or curative radiofrequency ablation, we have uh, um, identified these factors, so the tumor sites and the previous radiation therapy. On the other hand, um, factors predicting complications after palliative or curative bone cryoablation uh, where uh, the uh, poor performance status of the patients, uh, the procedure performed in a tumor located in a long bone, and the large ablation area achieved with more than three uh, cryoprobes. So uh, the most common major complication that we, can, that we have found following uh, ablation of bone metastasis and bone tumors uh, were secondary fractures, which occurred with similar rates uh, uh, both with radiofrequency and cryoablation. Coming to other uh, complications dealing with uh, injuries uh, uh, to nearby non-target organs, uh, including nerve roots, uh, cartilage, and skin, uh, we had almost similar, similar results with uh, cryo and RFA. But coming to pain, uh, to postoperative pain, which was the main factor um, dealing to the increased rate of uh, minor complication in uh, uh, the, the radiofrequency ablation, ab ablation group, uh, it occurred in 18% of uh, cases, uh, which was not the case with cryo, which where we came across uh, a 2% of postoperative pain. So as I was telling you before, cryoablation has uh, uh, less uh, um, probability to come uh, uh, to, to, to result uh, in uh, a painful postoperative phase. So patients are likely to go home uh, much faster compared to radiofrequency ablation. And in fact, uh, as the team from Mayo Clinic have highlighted a few years ago, they, um, when they compared the results with rare RFA and cryo, RFA patients were more likely to stay more in the hospital. And we know if we have a look at all the different classification, this is the classification from the SEER society, this is the classification of CRC. So in both classifications, um, pro, uh, having a prolonged uh, hospital stay means that uh, um, is considered as a complication. So, this does not mean that we should not use radiofrequency ablation due to 
painful, uh, painful post-operative phase. We, this means just that we need to be ready to um, take care of these, uh, of these patients uh, receiving radiofrequency ablation in the post-operative phase with dedicated analgesic protocols. So we need to discuss with our anesthesiologists and we need to be ready with them to propose effective analgesic protocols uh, in order to prevent the post-operative phase um, which may be painful with radiofrequency ablation. Coming to fractures uh, uh, that are uh, the main uh, uh, complication, the main major complication, these patients had uh, uh, radio okay, sorry, cry ablation and, and radiation therapy, and uh, he and she came back a few weeks later with uh, uh, a bone insufficiency fracture which needed uh, percutaneous osteosynthesis. So, in order to prevent fracture, we need to consolidate within the same ablation uh, session in order to prevent uh, the most common major complication coming from uh, uh, percutaneous ablation. The only uh, case where we can avoid uh, percutaneous uh, bone consolidation following ablation is when we treat uh, sclerotic bone tumors, like for example in this metastasis from uh, pancreatic cancer, so the, 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 that was treated with um, cry ablation due to a painful status of the patient. And the bone in this case uh, is so hard that even if you provide ablation, it won't uh, face, uh, uh, it is less likely to face uh, a secondary fracture in the post-operative phase. So there is no need to provide consolidation in this kind of patients. Uh, how to avoid the minor complication related to injuries to nearby structures, non-target structures that in most of the cases are nerve roots and cartilage. Basically, we need to use um, all the different uh, protective measures that we have available in our momentarium, including in most of the cases, thermal monitoring and hydro dissection. For the, ter for the nerve roots, we need to keep in mind that this is the safety range of temperature at which we need to keep nerve roots during our ablation in order to avoid a secondary injury. And uh, for specifically for nerve roots, uh, we can provide advanced uh, uh, monitoring techniques, including neural monitoring and, uh, um, and uh, electro, electro stimulation. So keep in mind that to reduce the risk of secondary damages to nerve roots and cartilage, we need to be really generous with uh, the protective measures during our procedure. So in, to conclude, uh, RFA and cryo are uh, currently the most established techniques uh, to provide uh, ablation. Probably in the near future, microwave and IFO will increase their role. But for the moment, the most of the data are available with, two, with these two techniques. Uh, all the techniques are effective in achieving pain relief. And uh, in order to achieve a local tumor control, we need to clearly and perfectly select our patients. Either we work in the palliative treatment, in the palliative field, either we work in the curative field, if we provide our treatment in combination with the radiation therapy, we, shall, we will be likely uh, be more effective. So we, our treatment will be more effective if we combine them with uh, other oncologic treatments, including overall radiation therapy. Major complications are really few. Uh, most of the cases, they are fractures and may be uh, clearly prevented, prevented with uh, uh, bone consolidation provided in the same ablation uh, session. Minor complications are uh, rare compared uh, in terms of uh, injuries to nearby non target structures, uh, which may be prevented with uh, um, generous application, generous use of uh, protective measures. Please keep in mind that radio frequency ablation may be painful and should this pain should be prevented with uh, dedicated analgesic protocols shared with your uh, anesthesiologist. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roberto, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, we're gonna have the, the session for, for questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so if you can please uh, wait to the, the session to hear the questions from our um, participants, uh, we're very pleased. And thank you again for your brilliant presentation. And now I would like to to call Dr. Alexis Kelekis 
from Greece. He's going to speak about cementoplasty and percutaneous osteosynthesis of bone tumors. Please, Dr. Alexis. Thank you very much. Hello, Roberto. Hello, Leonardo. Uh, Professor Bordalo, thank you very much for this invitation. I hope our uh, viewers enjoy. Roberto, you have to unshare so I can share my own screen. Okay, so let me try how this works. I'm not very good in all of this. Uh, let's try this and share. Uh, do you see it? We're starting to see yeah. now. Yeah, it's good. good. Let me let me see how I can arrange this. Okay, so there we are. Uh, so our discussion is about symptomatopathy and percutaneous uh, osteosynthesis in bone tumors. So I have no disclosures um, specific to the talk. Uh, this is a question for you. No, I think it's not working now. You have to. Is it working or not? No. Now we can see your first page, oh. but not first screen. But not. It's not. Present. Because it says your screen sharing is paused. So resume share. Is it working now? No. Yeah, but it's not maximized. Mm. Yes, yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. It's so, so I have this. You can see it. So I have no disclosures, as I said before. And the the um, the issue is that if you have only one tool, and this is a hammer, then all the word looks like a nail. So you have to be very careful if you do one technique, uh, not to fit everything in one technique. And you have to have a bigger toolbox in order to fit everything in. And our purpose here is to uh, achieve what we want, which is uh, minimize uh, the uh, risk and optimize the results, which includes uh, uh, the medical assessments, which is the patient condition, the lesion treatment, the technical approach, and the biomechanical stability of the lesion that we want to treat. So how and which lesions uh, should we treat? Well, now we have guidelines out of NCNN. This is our 2018, but we have also uh, other uh, guidelines. Uh, on adult cancer pain, which includes, apart from the classic NSIAs, they include now RFA and stabilization and ablation. And uh, as you can see here, when we're talking about spine, we're talking about surgical stabilization and vertebral augmentation, which have now been accepted in the guidelines and treatments algorithms of the NCNN guidelines. And there are other consensus panels on like in general bone of oncology, which uh, actually uh, accept uh, radiofrequency ablation, percutaneous cryoplasty and uh, cementoplasty and vertebroplasty as effective with patients who are poor surgical candidates. So we are starting to make an impact in this world. Now, as I was saying, the important is to discuss which treatment and when should we treat it, and we need algorithms for that. Uh, we should move out from the case report to a more generalized and consensus approach. And one of these uh, indexes that we can use is called SINS, which is a spine instability neoplastic score. And you can have a scoring system for uh, the location or the pain relief or the vertebral body collapse. And out of this, you get a full score, uh, which uh, then makes sense whether to treat by percutaneous approach or not. And uh, we should not also forget the older system and older classifications like the Magell classifications and what we treated up till now, which was A1 stable fractures. So uh, we should be able to identify what's an A1, an A2, an A3, uh, and uh, decide upon those merits whether we're going to treat it or not. And the idea now is to move from what we call the A1 fractures to more complicated uh, fractures and to be able to give a better consolidated support and structure. And that's why we use those scores. And for example, for the hip, we have the mural score, uh, which again uh, gives us an indication when to treat and when not to treat and what is uh, a possibility of a risk of a fracture uh, compared to a conservative treatment. Uh, 
We should not reinvent the wheel. This work has been done uh, quite extensively by surgeons and we should take the surgical reference and try to implement that in our practice. And by uh, going there, we can go to uh, AO Foundation and you can find all this information about the different types of fracture and when those fractures are stable or unstable and when they need consolidation by uh, more complicated systems than just cement. And again, I'm giving you some of these uh, 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 tables that they have, like the per trochantic fractures or the multifragmented fractures and uh, or the displaced subcapital fractures. And all of this information can be used in our also armamentarium and in our uh, way of treating. Uh, another question that we have to figure out when we're going to do those percutaneous treatments, which are outside the simple and, uh, and a simple injection of cement is the forces which are attributed to the area. So if you do not want your cement to fail, then you should think about the force vectors which affect the field where you're going to place your uh, structure. And for example, you have specific acetabular forces which have been uh, pretty much analyzed again by orthopedic wool. And that's why these are the forces that you should follow when you're going to do a, a, a structural support in the area. And that's why they put the screws in the couple uh, vertical like, uh, like sun rays uh, to, to give that stability. So uh, again, going to the uh, technical approach, how are we going to approach the lesion in the pelvis, for example? Well, these uh, approaches has been extensively reported in the past and you can use simple fluoroscopy. At uh, the time, we only had a simple fluoroscopy in order to achieve uh, either the pubic ramus or the inferior pubic ramus or the posterior uh, sciatic column. So uh, the whole idea here is that now you have more uh, interesting uh, devices like fusion imaging, like 3D, uh, like cone beam CT, and you can integrate that to your fluoroscopy and help you uh, navigate your needles to the exact point through you want. And this is one of the advantages that we have as interventional radiologists compared to orthopedic surgeons, which have not yet, uh, again, uh, until now mastered uh, the uh, navigation through imaging. This is something that will change in the future, so we should stay ahead of this game. Again, uh, when you're talking about pelvic and pelvic fixation, you have to understand that there are columns and you have to understand that you have to support this column. So for the acetabulum, there's the two column concept, an anterior uh, column with a screw, a posterior column for the ischial part with a screw, an anteroposterior screw, which is anterograde or retrograde in order to give structural support. So this is the three columns, the, the two columns that you have to support. And of course, you have to go through them with a vertical also structure to give that st uh, stability. For the sacrum, you have transverse iliosacral screws and oblique iliosacral screws. Not all corridors are always uh, possible, and especially in females which have larger pelvis, sometimes the approach can be uh, very tricky. So it's sometimes very difficult to identify the uh, exact corridor that you want to pass through. Another uh, technical approach that you have to understand is that there are structures there that you do not want to injure. And that can be the brachial plexus for the upper um, torso. It can be the foramen, the nerve nerves, or the pudental nerve that you do not want uh, to hit, or the lumbar plexus, or the uh, vessels, or the sacral nerve roots, or the sciatic nerve. So these are noble structures that, of course, when you have an ambulant patient uh, doing a significant lesion to those nerves can affect the outcome, and you can end up with a paraplegic patient. So it's very uh, important to understand the anatomy and understand the vascular structures and nerve structures that you do not want uh, to uh, hamper. So we started in the, in the past from cement and needles, and then we moved to different, different vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty kits. And now we had curved needles and biologics to end up to implant-based technologies. So this is a very uh, quickly evolving field with more and more percutaneous material available. And we should uh, understand which lesion will benefit from which technique. But 
to understand that, we have to define our objective. What is the objective? We need a construct that will be durable. You want a construct that will allow fast mobilization and will provide the biomechanical stability that you want for this patient to be mobile. So the idea here is not to have a patient that will be able to join the Olympics. The idea here is to have a patient that can serve himself and have a good quality of life. And especially with the patients that we're talking, which are usually metastatic patients and elderly patients, their mobility and their activity is very, very important. So are we going to transform everything to um, screws and uh, complicated constructs? Of course not. Standard cementoplasty and injection of PMMA works in peripheral areas if you take those considerations that we discussed uh, in mind. So uh, there are a lot of literatures that showing that you have very good high improvement, or even if you consider the mild improvement, the vast majority will improve with just the injection and stabilization of PMMA, provided that you have a good mechanical structure. Now, if you move to other techniques, then we're, what we're talking with PMMA and instrumentation for bone and support augmentation, we're talking about systems which are closed fixations. So these closed fixations will give you the structural support that you want. And uh, there are quite a few papers out there showing exactly this, that you can give that structural support uh, to uh, give uh, a good uh, result. And what are these materials that we have? Well, you have what we could call percutaneous internal fixation devices, which are screws, are peak, are wires and pins, and are intramedullary rods and nails. And this material can be placed uh, in a minimal invasive way under uh, visualization by some kind of imaging device. So uh, in order to give an example, this is work that's done by Frederick Deschamps uh, about percutaneous osseous synthesis in the pelvic in cancer patients. And exactly what uh, Frederick discussed in this, patient, uh, in this uh, paper and reviewed is actually what are the corridors and how you're going to put those screws in order to give what we were discussing about biomechanical stability and have what we wanted is the uh, the good effect and the good pain palliation that we want. So uh, I would advise for you to go and read those uh, papers that actually show you these corridors, how you're going to place those screws and how you're going to find these corridors in order to give that biomechanical stability. For example, this is a paper in uh, radiology in 2019 uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the corridors of the pelvis. And you're going to use all the technology you have. For example, you can use cone beam CT. So we, in this case, for example, we place the needles under fluoroscopy and followed up the final position with uh, cone beam CT. And you can see the screw placement and the cement injection. And this is one screw and this is the second screw and the cement for the stabilization. And you can turn around the lesion. And if you have fusion imaging, you can use fusion imaging also to help you navigate through uh, the anatomical landmarks. Now, why do we need the screws and why do we need that biomechanical stability? Simply because cement is not enough in long bones. And that's because you, uh, you don't have only compression, fract, uh, uh, compre compression forces, but you have also shearing forces and torsion forces and bending forces. And in those cases, cement uh, PMMA is not strong enough to hold uh, together, especially if you have a highly lytic lesions which have eroded the cortex. So that's why you need a complementary technique to give that structural support. And uh, uh, there are again these uh, papers and the work from Frederick that shows exactly that concept. He took the mural scored, so he had this pure criteria for these patients and follow that criteria and uh, for, saw that if these patients were not treated, the uh, risk of pathologic fracture was quite high compared to what he can do with cement and screws. So this is another example, a patient with a lytic lesion that was treated only with osteoplasty and he ended up with a fracture uh, which ended up in a prosthesis. And this is what you do not want because this uh, destroys your technique, then the future when you want to treat those patients, the answer will be, uh, let's go directly to a total hip replacement and do not do those kind of stabilizations. 
Another paper which is uh, very interesting is from Giovanni Carlo Anselmetti in Italy, where he used uh, bone marrow nails under hybrid computer tomography and fluoroscopy system in order to do this kind of stabilizations. And uh, again, uh, the work from Frederick, which moved to another system, which is called the y strut which actually it's a peak implant that you can put percutaneously and you can inject cement through that peak implant. So you can again do a combined stabilization of cement and peak in order to give the forces that you want, the structural support that you want for hip uh, lesions. Uh, we uh, described another technique, which is called the rebar construct, and you can see those uh, vertebroplasty needles placed, and through them you can put an ablation. In this case, we use the microwave ablation in order to destroy the lesion. This is the pet of the lytic lesion, and uh, once we ablated the lesion, we placed some uh, uh, pins, some uh, uh, metallic pins, which were uh, placed through the needles, creating a mesh. And through that mesh, we injected cement. And this is the final structural support with the mesh and the uh, metallic implants and the cement injected. We tried that in different bones. And this is another example in uh, humeral bone for uh, micro needles, mesh, and cement uh, for a neuroesthesioblastoma and the structural support that we provided in this patient. Now, bear in mind that this structure is not for somebody who's going to do weightlifting. This structure is important for someone who wants to have mobility and achieve a, a better quality of life than having his hand in continuous pain. So one has to establish uh, what is the uh, expected uh, result and what are the goals of your intervention and what are the objectives of the intervention that you're going to do. Are these structures stable? Well, this is follow-up of these patients in a long time from 2011, two years up. Uh, this is a multiple myeloma patient with elytic lesions. And you can see that we did not have any migration of material in two years follow-up in continuous uh, x-rays that we will follow up with the patient that continues to do very well. So as we talk now, we can move from the A1 stable fractures to more complicated fractures, not only peripherally, but also in the spine. And in this case, uh, you can do uh, more complicated systems like the PEAK system, which uh, were followed for two years. And they showed both pain relief and height restoration, which remain statistically different during the follow-up period. And uh, again, you have other biomechanical system, which is called the stand screw assisted internal fixation, SIF for short, which actually it's a metallic uh, stent, which is then anchored by a screw in the periphery and the whole complex is injected with cement. So this work was done by Alexandro Cianfoni in Switzerland and in Ticino. And this is how uh, the work, uh, he, this is how the technique works, which is the A2 Magell fractures. You can see the vertical fracture and exploded vertebral body. You can put the stent in and through the stent, you can place a screw. So you anchor the stent with a screw in order to stabilize your whole construct. And you can do that in a bilateral fashion. And we have new materials coming up like the V-strut, which actually are peak implants, and you can inject cement through the peak. And that, again, gives you a better consolidation because then the cement is blocked through the peak, which works as an anchor to hold your soil structure. Now, if we push the bar even further, you can see even more complicated structures like here, where you can put one, two, three Cruise and uh, again design the whole corridor and design the whole structure of your approach using uh, fusion systems and this is work done in uh, Wisconsin uh, where they can use these fusion systems in order to identify what are the corridors and what are the biomechanical uh, needs in order to do the structural support. Now there are a lot of discussion whether uh, this system works or no. Um, and there are still a lot of biomechanical evaluation needed. So you can see that you have bone marrow nails uh, and there are studies which shows that these are robust and this has been disputed by other papers. Still, there's a lot of work to be done on the biomechanical world for, uh, in order to prove that concept that we have seen in patients, that these biomechanical structures work. 
So uh, again, uh, whether we should do with Kishner or with long, without Kishner for long uh, bones, uh, there is need for a more solid biomechanical evaluation. The idea is that uh, whatever you do, especially if you use Kirchner in long bones, you have to lock that device down because again, if you just put metallic structures in the middle without locking them in some way, then the rotational forces here, especially in long bones, femurs and humerus in the middle will risk to dislodge your construct. As we heard before uh, about RFA, it's very interesting, not only by itself, but by as a combined and adjunctive treatment. So all these treatments work together. So you need ablation in order to control the tumor locally. You need your construct in order to give structural support. And you need your radiotherapy in order to control peripherally the tumor. And what was interesting with this work from Distazo, actually they showed that if you do combine treatments like RFA and radiotherapy, you increase the overall response. You diminish the, uh, you increase the uh, pain relief and you diminish the time to pain relief. So all of this is very important uh, to show again that the adjunctive effect of treatment is very, very important. Again, you can use combined system like cryoablation and osteoplasty reinforced with Kishner wires in order to give that structural support and at the same time ablate the lesion. Or you can do other techniques like thermal ablation uh, augmented with screws. So you can place your needle, do your ablation, place your screw and cement the whole structure in place. Now, of course, nothing is perfect and there are the risk of complications like neurovascular bundle injury, bleeding, cement leakage, implant displacement, material failure and fracture, and of course, tumor overgrowth. This is one example of a paper with tumoral dissemination along the screw trajectory in a percutaneous osteosynthesis uh, and non-described complication. You can see that the metastasis actually outgrew through uh, the uh, approach of the needle. So in theory, this kind of approaches would be interesting, uh, specifically if you combine it with ablation, which we usually do. So in conclusion, there are a lot of papers showing exactly what we talked about. And you can find the literature and more and more interventional radiologists are now doing this combined treatment with screw placement and cement placement and ablation. But again, we need to organize a little bit our work and literature and follow specific guidelines in order to have good indications and in order to be able to identify exactly uh, which are the patients to be treated. So as take home points, I would say that different fractures, uh, lesion morphology and location demand a tailored patient-centered approach. The lesion treatment and the technical approach depends on the implant and cement construct, which should improve the pain function and stabilization. And of course, the biomechanical stability is very important, which we need to be as close as to bone in the biomechanics and uh, provide the implants would provide an opportunity for better structural support than simple cement. We will be able perhaps in the future to have specific biologic coatings for the tumor and do a specific drug delivery platform with those implants. Percutaneous screw fixation with osteoplasty is feasible and provides significant benefit with quick recovery. Bicortical screws through the standard corridors provide the most structural support, so better fixation on the corticals. If you use cement, it's beneficial for bone quality and uh, bicor if bicortical fixation is not possible. As I said, advanced image guidance with fluoroscopy, CT, and fusion imaging can provide you better imaging uh, navigation for your approach. And if you have a rapidly progressive disease, then you have to overstabilize. As in the past, for example, in when we were using stents, we were, we, go, we were putting an oversized stent. Well, here you have to overstabilize in order to give uh, a better effect, in order to be able to drown, to have margins, to drown the tumor inside your cement and your structure. Future directions will include integration of these advanced uh, techniques with ablation and specific planning software with robotics guidance that will give us exactly the construct that we need to make as a pre-model before we do the injection of the stabilization. And of course, we can also uh, work a lot with pelvic trauma. So with this, I would like to thank you. 
I would like to invite you to participate to SIO, which are Society of Interventional Oncology, and in which a lot of this work is being done. We are still trying to make a Congress for uh, San Francisco and California for 2021, if we are able. And the, our Congress for the spine, the Sardinia spine this year was um, unfortunately canceled, but we hope to change this 2020 to 2021. So stay healthy and be there. And I hope we will be able to meet uh, up and close. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexis, for the best, for amazing presentation. It was very nice. And thank you very much. And we have some, one question here, and we have until, we have still five minutes for questions. So I will start with a question from the audience and from Ernesto Moya. And I think we could be for both. Many studies show the use of the RF and cementation cementoplasty have a good long-term result in pain control. In your experience, is really useful? Alexis, would you like to answer you first? Or uh, are you like? We cannot hear you. I would say that please go because it's about ablation, so it's part of your uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Basically, um, as I showed you, when you provide uh, ablation, radiation therapy, and bone consolidation, this is the best you can provide in terms of local tumor co of, uh, or in terms of pain relief. However, if you have uh, a predominantly uh, a patient with uh, a short life expectancy, with a purely mechanic pain, with a multimetastatic disease, where you don't need really to achieve uh, uh, a local tumor control, you can use uh, simply a bone consolidation. So it really depends on your case, on your patient, and you need to discuss this in a multidisciplinary way. Because if, even if you have a, a, um, an inflammatory pain in a, in a bedridden patient and you provide a simple um, the MMA injection into the lytic bone mats, uh, the patient will be validated as well. So it really depends. You need to make a balance be in terms of uh, um, life expectancy, uh, quality of life expected for the patient, and cost of the procedure and technical difficulties related to the procedure in order to make the best choice for your patient. I will agree. I will add that we have now some data about uh, peripheral tumor cells uh, circulating. So there has been a study out there which shows that if you do a vertebroplasty uh, or a kyphoplasty, it doesn't matter for that, an augmentation procedure in a tumor bed, then you have an augmentation of the circulating tumor cells, the CTCs. If that is important or no, we do not know because we do not know if those circulating tumor cells will go and increase and make new metastatic lesions. Anecdotally, we all have seen the patient that came with one metastasis and six months later, he is full of lesions everywhere. So, but this has not been proven. That said, I will agree completely with Roberto. It depends on what you want to do. If you were in a palliative setting, you have a multi-metastatic patient, you want to treat as many lesions as you want, uh, as you can, as fast as you can, to relieve as much pain as you can, then ablation is an overkill. If you have few lesions that you want to control tumor, the tumor effect and you want to decrease the probability of that tumor expanding locally and perhaps diminishing the risk of circulating tumor cells, then ablation is part of your equation. Agree. Uh, so we can I have one question, another question. And for Katsato, uh, I know you have MRI in your, ser in your service and it's used for, uh, to guide the procedures. And how do you choose the MSK procedures that will be guided by MRI? MRI? And do you, do you know so do you think there is a specific uh, lesion that it's the, the MRI help, helps more? MRI is perfect in soft tissues. In bone, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. So unless you have uh, a lesion with a complete uh, cortical bone disruption, 
so which allows you to have an easy access to, to direct access to the tumor. MRI for bones, uh, I mean, the procedure on bones uh, is quite uh, unrealistic. I would say that uh, a much more interesting place may be uh, expected with MRI for uh, uh, soft tissue lesions, uh, arteriovenous uh, malformation, for example, cryoablation of pain from uh, arteriovenous malformation, uh, desmoid tumors, soft tissue metastasis. So in these kind of cases, uh, it's really valuable because you have uh, an intrinsic uh, uh, contrast um, of the lesion. And so you clearly see it without any kind of need for a uh, contrast medium. So rather than in bone, I see a larger place for this technique, for this imaging uh, modality in soft tissue lesions. Do you have any question, Marcelo? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to ask uh, Roberto, you talked about the epidural metastases and uh, not so good results in midterms. So do you contraindicate for palliation uh, uh, in these patients, do you contraindicate radioablation in, in spinal cord compression, Roberto? No, the idea, uh, my, what I wanted to say uh, is that, that if you go for a local tumor control and you had already an epidural involvement, you are dead. You cannot achieve it. So if the goal of your treatment is purely palliative, you can go for a palliative treatment. You don't care of the epidural involvement. You can provide uh, ablation, you can provide uh, bone consolidation, vertebral augmentation, you can provide whatever you want, it will be effective. But if you are looking for local tumor control with an epidural involvement, this is not something uh, that you can achieve. So it was referred to the local tumor control. Okay. But and, what are, and what about the cord compression? Do you think if, ablation if has a role? If I can help with that, if I can, sorry, if I can add something yes, to it. Sure. Uh, you don't forget that you also can do combination treatments. For example, the case that Roberto showed would, if otherwise, would have ended with a complete corpectomy. Okay, he would need uh, a replacement of the vertebral body and a multiple level uh, stabilization with a posterior fixation, which would complicate a lot and would might probably affect the survival of this patient. It would be easier, as Roberto did, do the stabilization, do the ablation, and deal with the epidural component by just doing a posterior laminectomy or just opening the canal a little bit wider in that area because what you want actually is to provide a better quality of life for this patient. So that is what exactly Roberto said. It all depends on the case and what are the objective goals that you want to succeed. So for example, they tried ablation, they tried stabilization, they tried radiotherapy, and then they could have done a small laminectomy in the area just to give some space uh, and avoid the possibility of, uh, of a neural compromise. We, we, didn't do the, we didn't do the laminectomy because the patient was uh, uh, asymptomatic and then he, he, he was dead uh, sh sh shortly after. But of course, the corporectomy could be uh, an, an alternative. But we need to bear in mind, as Alexis has said, that the rate of uh, complication uh, and, and, the, and the mortality rate of, uh, orthopedic surgery, of orthopedic surgery done on bone metastasis, especially in the spine, may be as high as a 30%. So it's something really hard for the patient. Uh, so when it should be provided, should be provided in uh, patients with a really uh, long life expectancy and with the, uh, and young patients and with a very good uh, performance status. Perfect. Thank you very much, Roberto and Alex, for your availability. It was very nice. Thank you. So, Bruce, is, it, was a, it was a solidarity webinar. It was very nice for many uh, many proposals and thank you very much for your for availability thank you thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank you marcello thank you leonardo thank you alexis thank you very thank much you. For the thank you guys take care. If I
it, what you did is really impressive and uh, uh, it was it is uh, great for the community and uh, i'm proud to participate in this action that helped a lot of people that are in need so thank you for the invitation and congratulations for the idea and so richard for doing this thank you Alex. thank you bye 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 guys bye guys